Hi, welcome to another episode of People and Management. I'm Sally Foley Lewis, and I'm absolutely excited and delighted to have my guest with us on this episode, Jane Anderson. So, welcome to the episode, Jane. Thank you so much for having me. How exciting we get to work together. Yeah, I love working with you. Yeah. So, well, I know all about you. You know all about me. But let me give an intro so everyone knows who you are. So, um, (laughs) apart from me having this uh, quite silly little girl crush on Jane, she she is an influencer expert with over 20 years experience in personal branding. She's worked with over 50,000 people on having more impact and influence in their business communications and their career. She was recently voted number 23 in the world's best branding blogs and in the top 30 branding gurus globally. This girl knows her stuff. She is the host of the iTunes podcast, The Jane Anderson Show, and has been featured in Business Insider, Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, Courier Mail, and been on Sky Business News. Her clients include Virgin Australia, Lego, Ikea, Rio Tinto, and Origin Energy, and I'm sure the list is much longer than that. (laughs) <laughs> She's been nominated for the Telstra Business Women's Awards three times and is the author of five books, including her latest, The Expert to Influencer, 12 Skills to Attract Clients, Increase Sales, Leverage a Personal Brand, and to Become an Industry Leader. And this is my current Bible, by the way. So love <laughs> this book, love this book. And so Jane, thank you so much for spending some time with me. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. So, thank um, you. I think I just have to get you to come to all my events to introduce me. <laughs> Actually, that's right. I nearly do. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. I'd always love to MC. So I'm your girl. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, Jane, I I love what you do and what you've done for me in my own business in the last uh, year or two has taken me to a whole other level. I'm playing a bigger game and one of the things that I have no problems with sharing with, with everyone is that this isn't an easy game to be in when you're working for yourself. But I think the, the, the goal that you share with me in our mentoring process, I think applies to any manager, anybody inside an organisation. And, mm. um, you know, when you say to me, Sally, I'll hold the belief you do the work, I think that was, that was a turning point for me. And I want to share that because I think everyone needs to know that having a mentor, whether you're running your own business or you are inside an organisation, is hands down one of the best gifts you can give yourself. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, exactly. And, and the reason why I say that to you, you know, why I said it to you is because my mentor said it to me. And I just know the value of, you know, when you have a mentor, you, you, you're being pushed or you're working because you, you sort of, what's the saying? If, if you, um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and getting uh, and expecting a different result. So, you know, the purpose of having a mentor is going, okay, well, what are they doing differently that I'm doing? And that's going to mean that you have to do something that you haven't done before. And that often involves fear. Like, oh my God, is this actually what you do? <laughs> like you made it look so easy and mm. now I've got myself into this. And so to be able to do it, you have to know that like, there's two things it takes and you know, one is mindset and one is actually doing the work. The challenge though is sometimes you come up against that barrier of, well, oh, geez, it's hard to do the work because my mind is, you know, that fight or flight's kicking in, which is, you know, a, a natural um, uh, you know, the thing that happens when you're doing something you've never done before. So when you've got your mentor with you, I always find that if I, I know the impact it had on me when I was learning. So, um, so it's something that I often say to a, to a mentee because if I know that experience, I'm, and a lot of people will say to me, oh, this is really easy for you. You know, you're just used to putting yourself out there. And as you know, I spent years not doing this and making sure everybody else was able to market themselves and position themselves so I was really happy sitting behind the scenes so I totally get how hard it is to have the comfort of putting yourself out there but Mm -hmm. if you can if you have somebody who can just say look I'm with you I'll hold the belief you hand that one over you delegate that to me and all you need to do is just keep going and doing the work and then that it's almost like you you relieve it relieves you of so much pressure Mm -hmm. and then it's just putting one foot in front of the other isn't it oh absolutely and and it, it doesn't mean that every day goes smoothly, but it certainly sets you up to have easier 
um, mm. easier to achieve milestones as you go. So definitely. Yes. Yeah. Look, I, I have a lot of li listeners who are within organisations and so they're leaders and predominantly they're, they're middle managers or at least that they have some, some form of a team that reports to them and then they need to report to a senior leader or a board. And so one of the things I find interesting is that why would any sort of internal leader or manager need any branding assistance? <laughs> I know, right? I used to think, I remember when this whole term of personal brand came out, it was, I was second year uni in 1997, so I'm kind of showing my age a little bit. But, uh, but I remember thinking the same thing. I remember thinking, who on earth gets a personal brand? Like, that sounds like something that people buy if they've got like too many shoes or, you know, <laughs> like they've got more money than cents. Like, who, else, who does that? Um, but that was long before anything like, you know, social media or anything, anything digital came about. But mm. the reality was, was what I realised, I started working with personally brand, personal brands since I was 14 years old. Mm. And so what, uh, so from a leadership perspective in an organisation, the reality is, is we've got a personal brand whether we like it or not. Mm. So it's just whether we actually stop and consciously become aware that we've actually got one. Mm. And when you're consciously aware, then you have, choices so up until then uh, until you have awareness of that ignorance is bliss but <laughs> but when you start to go oh hold on so this is actually what am I trying to do is this what actually I'm understood in my organization to represent where does that intersect with what the organization is actually about mm. and how do I communicate that how do I and also how do we um, well, I say branding state made up of three things, clarity, getting clear about who you are, what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go. So that's your own personal vision, mission and values, which mm. is what an organisation and a, and a corporate brand has too. Um, mm. And then you need to uh, be able to communicate that value. So how do you do that? Do you, how do you run your meetings? Where do you show up? Where are you, how visible are you? Are you turning up with a voice? And then the third part is control and control is about when things go wrong. So, and uh, so in other words, you know, like, so, you know, so, you know, and you talk a lot about this, Sally, like if, if you're a leader and you've got a team member who's underperforming, then do you just put your head in the sand and hope that it'll just kind of get better? Or do you take some time to, to give them some feedback? Do you go and explore what's wrong? Do you go and see if they're okay and then put some steps in place to try and help them to succeed and achieve their potential? Um, and that builds trust. A brand is all about trust. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, the, I think a lot of people forget that control part. They think it's just clarity and then putting your face on LinkedIn and that's about it. But the control part the control is all about that creates that's character that's when you show that there really is a brand here and it's not just me going i'm so good look at me and i'm such a rock star <laughs> you might well, you be are, you are a rock star. <laughs> uh, thank you but yeah everybody's a rock star i think everybody's got you know amazing talents and mm. and abilities that sometimes it's scary to to communicate that value unless you're really clear about what you're trying to do so we sort of end up a little bit, you know, like we, we have this tall poppy in Australia that makes it really hard to, to communicate our value. And so it does take a lot of courage to do that. Mm. And interestingly, you say that in Australia, we have tall poppies. I'm actually aware that in other countries, they have similar situations. There's a tall mm. tulip as well, which I've heard of just recently. Um, and I think you make a really good point that um, for any leader or manager who's struggling to either delegate or they struggle with a team member in some way that, and I don't mean to make the job worse or harder for them, but the reality is that how they behave in that crisis and in that moment mm. is not just um, impacting on them and that employee, but everyone who's watching. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. I think that control piece is really important. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's always controlling about not being a control freak, mm -hmm. but, um, but being able to step up and take control and then be, if you're in the leadership position, if, if that's your role to do that, then take responsibility, take the lead, show people what needs to be done. And if rather, than, you know, if, if you're saying that you're a leader and you've got whatever title or you're positioning yourself as that, 
But if you're not taking control and things go wrong, then mm. are you really the leader you say you are? And, mm. Mm. and then because when people see those things, that builds that trust. So they, they're able, you're better to, able to influence in the times that, that it really matters. If you're having to go and have a conversation with a stakeholder to say, look, hey, listen, can I just have a chat to you about this deadline on this project? I know that we said we were going to have it done by this date, but my concern is this. If you've built up that, what I call brand equity, if you've built up enough equity that you've shown that you are, um, you've built up enough trust, you've done, uh, put enough into that trust bank account, as Covey says in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, if you've built up enough credits in that account, you've stepped up, then of course you're going to have so much more credibility and trust. Mm. You know, they'll go, oh, look, that's fine, no problem. But if you consistently don't meet deadlines and budgets and all that sort of stuff and you ask for another, uh, another you know, extension, then you've lost all credibility, you've lost trust. So, you know, you, that's, that means you've got a bit of brand building <laughs> to do. Yeah, and, and uh, the way you're saying it makes a whole lot of sense that if you're, if, if you're just the, the, the bank of excuses, then you're, you're very empty on trust and, and very empty. Or your, your brand, there is a brand, but it's not the one you probably want because you're, you know, you're full of excuses, you're not actually being a leader as such. So That's right. And yeah. I think one of the things that sometimes I see come up in workplaces, and I know it happened to me, uh, is around when you've inherited someone else's brand as mm. part of your role. So I remember I took on the learning and development manager's role for a large organisation, it was about 10,000 staff at the time. And... I naively came in going, oh, great, you know, there's all these people, I'm going to meet all these new people, I'm going to meet stakeholders and I'm going to, you know, have an impact and it's going to be great. And then, and then when I got there, I didn't realise initially, but the person whose role I took on actually had a really bad reputation amongst the stakeholders. So, of course, they cringed when, <laughs> when I came in because they're, they're like, oh, yeah, okay, so you're their replacement. Oh, right, so you're from L&D. Okay. So I was actually carrying not only the person's reputation before me, but the department's reputation. Wow. And, uh, so, uh, and so I was like, okay, I'm dealing with a really depleted bank account here mm. and a really depleted brand, brand equity. So mm. it took a year. I was like, okay, it's going to take a year probably to build this up. And um, and I remember the day that this particular stakeholder was really hard nut to crack and, you know, I just persisted, always delivered on time, did whatever I could to support their team, made myself visible, did extra things to help them. And I remember the day that he sent me this email and uh, he was on the executive team and he said, um, you know, it's been so great having you, you here, you've really turned things around. I don't know what we would have done without you on this particular program and you know from then on I, I was able to get what I needed to have um, happen but but they'd, they've been through some tough times and mm. so sometimes that's really frustrating if you inherit someone else's brand or your department's brand and you feel a little bit powerless to change that. Oh, that and I think that insight is just a hundred percent as you were saying that it's reminded me I stepped into a CEO role and mm. Or like I got the job on the Friday and on Monday, even though it was an internal promotion, on the Monday, some, some of my team came up to me and said, now that you're here, can we fix the database? And I'm like, right. what was wrong with it? <laughs> <laughs> and right. unfortunately, yeah. there, was a, there was a really big issue that okay. was, um, you know, had the newspaper got hold of it, it would have been an interesting story. Um, but again, you know, you, your, your point about inheriting, I never thought of it that way before, but I inherited an issue. And, mm. um, you know, I feel grateful in one regard that the, that the staff said, now that you're here. Um, yeah, what a great <laughs> win. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can I dump all this on you? Um, but I'm also grateful. I, saw, I see myself looking back at that time now as the cleanup CEO. And that was maybe the brand I had to have for the yeah. benefit of the program, you know. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that, that comes out of that is a question I have for you is if, if a manager's listening to this now and they're thinking, okay, I don't have enough equity, maybe I'm not too sure um, and, you know, 
if I work a little bit on my clarity and my communication and, and I understand what you mean about control, then how do I go forth and do that? Because the team will notice and how, how do I get past that, that uneasy transition? Because I was X before and now I'm Y. What are people going to say to me? How do I cope with that? Yeah. Does that make I sense? Think, yeah. Uh, so t- correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm kind of thinking that what you're trying to do is first of all you can't you can't take any action until you've got uh, some insight into where things are at so if you know just being able to have a, a conversation even if it's that with with a stakeholder and just say listen you know i just really want to make sure that our working relationship is working well how are things going um you know what's working well in how we're going in this project or in our department if you're leading a department is to get feedback but I think one of the mistakes that people get is three, it's a fine line I know, is trying to do 360 feedback anonymously. And that isn't necessarily helpful. Mm. Um, I think it's even better relationship building if you can get that conversation face to face and just say, it just be real. Yes. So just say, Look, we're just, we just want to work really well together and, you know, we just want it to be good. So tell us what's good and, Tell us what you think could be better. And we might not be able to change everything, but we're just, and at least it shows that you're listening, but you're connecting. Mm. You're connecting mm. at that human level. We, we've talked about this a little bit uh, before, but it was around, you know, if you can just show that you're human, instead of sending, you know, a, we're sending you this email with a digital survey, could you please fill out the five points? Like, I know you want to capture data, but just be a human being about it. Mm. And, um, and then, even just that process, even if you don't get necessarily the feedback you want to hear, but even just doing that, even just that conversation. Um, so first of all is insight because you can't, you can't do anything until you've got insight. And then once you know, you know, I always think about, you know that book, um, uh, what is it, Love Languages mm-hmm. by Gary Chapman. It's the mm-hmm. same thing. What are the things that build the balance of the account? up is well what what are the the things that sort of build that account balance up Mm. and then um and then you you don't have to be someone you're not but what is the most authentic way for you to do that and help help that relationship grow Mm. um so one is insight one is then deciding on uh, which is the whole clarity bit you know we say clarity communication and control those three things Mm. so clarity is who are we who are you Mm. where are things at um then the second part is communicate so how do we work together to get that to work and then Mm. control is so control is about um agreements and trust so if things go wrong what do you want us to do or think things aren't this way what is what are the ground rules it creates something called psychological safety and so um a few clients of mine are experts in building trust in teams and and psychological safety so um, and that's because the the rules of engagement, if if you said, um, uh, we've got an agreement of of how we work together. So you're I'm clear on my brand and what I deliver, and then that doesn't damage your brand reputation. Mm. It's clear you haven't got that conversation going. Oh, do you know that they did this? So it doesn't end up behind people's backs, and you know you've done what you can to um, um, to manage that. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's probably, I don't know, I guess you see that all the time too. Oh, everything you just said, I'm just like, yes, yes. <laughs> um, especially starting with an open 360. Uh, I, I often have a lot of people say to ring me up and say, do you do 360s? Do you do them online? Do you do them anonymous, anonymously? And I said, let's have a chat about that. <laughs> because I think <laughs> you do miss the opportunity to, um, you know, you've got senior leaders who want their team to be out of feedback, to have open and honest conversations and to be respectful and, and to actually hear what's going on. And then you implement an anonymous 360. Like, there's a disconnect completely. So your point about that is absolutely bang on. And that insight piece, I think, is incredible. No matter where you are in an organisation, the more insight you have, mm. the, best place, the better place, the better you are placed to be able to then move forward with, with things like your communication and control. And, um, yeah, psychological safety, I think, is a big one. I mm. think we, we everyone could do with understanding a little bit more about that, I think. So, yeah. yeah, it's like trust on steroids. But if you can, <laughs> if you can take take your brand from not just being a trusted brand to now one where I get to be 
safe with you. Mm. So, you know, clients will come to me. Um, so one of the things that creates psychological safety in a brand is vulnerability. Mm. So, um, so, you know, even for myself, big part of my brand is non-judgment. So you can come to me and it, I don't care whether you've got a business that's just started up. I don't care if you've gone bankrupt. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not here to judge. I'm here to help. So, mm. or if you've got a business doing millions, like whatever, um, it's more, um, you know, we all need help at some stage. We all need to talk to someone. So, um, so I share my story of, you know, I've been through my own challenges and tough times and experiences. And so as a result, that creates a lot of safety. I find people are very open with me when they come to see me. They share their challenges and experiences. And as a leader, if you're in an organisation and you can share, you know, I was working with them. Um, I was working with the Department of, uh, oh, it was a little while ago now. It was, um, uh, anyway, it was the DG of this particular department, state government, and she shared that she suffered from depression during her mm -hmm. career and walked through, you know, why, and that's why she has a big, um, commitment to wellness for a lot of the team members and and you know I, I was like wow I've never actually heard a DG speak like this before as leaders I thought it was just great it's so refreshing and mm -hmm. suddenly it created the permission you know um, uh, who is it um, Mary, Marianne Williamson who says by you know by letting our light shine we give others permission to do the same so if you can have that permission then we haven't got stigma or as leaders we don't have that fear around asking for feedback mm. because we're not as afraid of oh, what if I get feed feedback or we have a conversation and I'm not getting something positive here or I'm going to look incompetent or, you know, it creates a whole lot of, um, I think times are really changing, but mm. I think leaders are still kind of, we're in an interesting time in teaching leaders how to use authenticity, vulnerability, empathy to create that human connection that's for sure oh yes and and sharing story i think is one of the mm. it's actually one of the easiest ways but it's also one of the toughest ways if you're getting in your own way of of understanding the value of you showing all of you to your team and i and i don't mean every single every single thing but the relevant stories and it's interesting that when you say that you know um most people sit in the room when their boss tells them a story or like of something that's happened and they what the whether it's a learning experience like a stuff up that's happened and kind of go well this is the learning curve from that and yeah we won't be doing that again um you know the team kind of resonates and goes oh there's a human yay so right. boss doesn't mean robot it means human uh, he's also trying to do well here and yes of course we've got the margins who will not jump on board but the, for for the majority i think most people want to do they want to do well they want to work with other humans and yeah. connect and and so that underpinning branding piece is so important your personal brand but also that story i think you what you say is just it's it's essential these days yeah well you know we're doing more with less we don't have the organizations we don't have the budgets anymore to carry underperforming people mm. so you know those days are gone mm. so now it's like okay what is every single hack i can find here to <laughs> to to create that engagement and that and it, i think it's even beyond engagement it's, it's about how do i bring out the best in other people and the only way I can do that is, you know, I, I have to be able to lead when you're in a leadership role is being aware that you're in a role or a position of authority or leadership, then you have a greater responsibility than the average person to be vulnerable or to be more human. Mm. And so it's not just about, oh, I don't want a leadership role because I don't want to manage people. I think the decision now is, do I want a leadership role because am I prepared to be vulnerable? Mm. I think is the, the change that's mm. happening. I think it's shifting from mm. responsibility of others to um, uh, feeling, being um, uh, that hiding or, or that trying to look competent mm. and now shifting over into actually my job is now really about connection. How do I do that? And and um, I'm sure you've heard of Jahari Window. It's about expanding that arena and showing more of yourself and thinning the facade because the facade is actually you know, 
we can smell it. Let's face it. You know, we all know when someone's not being entirely genuine or there's more to the story. And I think we, we all just want to cut to the chase in some regards. And, and I think that's the piece. I, you know, totally. I think we want to see more of that. And, and that choice, if you want to step into that leadership role, makes a lot of sense. You've got to know that that's probably what's going to be expected of you. So I think you make a great point there. I, and you know, that's, that leads me into thinking about, well, what's something practical that leaders and managers can do? And I know you've got the influencer indicator, which mm. I've done and I love it because it kind of goes, <laughs> bing, bing, here, Sally, this is what you need to work on, um, <laughs> which hurt, but truth is, <laughs> which is life. Yeah. Um, but it means also the influencer indicator was great because it doesn't mean that you you walk into the shopping center and you have to do everything you walk into the shopping center and go straight to the right shop to get the right thing um so that is gold so i would love for you to explain the influencer indicator yeah thanks so the influencer indicator really came about as a result of it really started because my own challenges in my own business so i lost a lot of money when i started my business on things like adwords and seo and i i trusted people and didn't do my own due diligence i didn't really necessarily understand what i was doing or I, was, I was doing what my friends were doing in business and i thought that that worked for me but it definitely didn't and uh, and i was way too trusting and but i didn't i was trusting but i also didn't know what to ask and so and i did a marketing degree so <laughs> i was like uh, but I, you know, I did also didn't trust myself because I went, well, I did a marketing degree, but it was like before the internet was installed. So like, I remember the day the internet was installed at uni and I thought, oh, is this like Encyclopedia Britannica or something? So, you know, my, I remember that, you know, so I actually lacked at the time, I didn't even trust myself that you know, I was, everything had changed. Everything was now digital and um, so uh, the the influencer indicator really came about as a result of from from that experience. I went right. Hold on, I I've got this. I'm a marketer. I know how to do this. It's just that the the platforms have changed a little bit, but the basic fundamentals of being able to identify how to build your networks, how to reach out and find people, how to build awareness about what you do, how to be findable and how to educate people on your message and what you're trying to create change or shift in. If you, those, those key areas, which is what the influencer indicator measures, um, those four fundamental areas, and there are actually 12 skills across those four quadrants, so you're right. The idea was to say, well, you know, if you're lost or don't know how to influence and how to get your message out there and how to be able to get in front of the right people or how to grow your business or your positioning in the market through your message is these are the 12 key skills you actually need to, to do. And if you undertake the questionnaire, then you actually identify, well, actually, I'm, wow, okay, there's 12 here that I need to do, but I actually just need to do those three to get started. Mm. So you don't get overwhelmed. Mm. Um, and as a leader, you know, one of those things might be, okay, well, I might not be a job seeker. You know, one of the things that comes up a lot is say something like, you know, LinkedIn. Do I have to write my LinkedIn profile? You know, but I'm going to look like a job seeker and everybody's going to freak out at work and think that I'm leaving. And that's not the case at all. You're actually a brand ambassador. Mm. So your responsibility is now, if you want to be, you know, your your job is actually your customer. You're actually serving your customer. You're being paid for its asset base of skills, abilities, tasks that you can do in exchange for money. That's called a job. However, <laughs> however, to, in today's world, the shift is actually thinking like your employer, like their customer, mm. and thinking, okay, so my job is to serve this customer as best I can. Um, so my job is to, how do I help this organization grow? This is who they are. And one of the things that I can do is attract opportunities to the organization. If I'm a leader, my job is to attract great talent. I'm now far more visible as part of this organization. So my job is not to write my prof LinkedIn profile like a job seeker. It's about having a profile that attracts great talent that someone mm -hmm. maybe reaches out and say, Hey, I've, heard about your organization um i don't know if you're the right person to speak to but i'm really interested about working there I, would i would it be okay if i give you a call or so when when we're building particularly off the influencer indicator if it's for leaders is 
you know, things like that come up that we say, well, what are you trying to do as a leader? What do you want to be known for? How are you positioning yourself in the market across these four quadrants to not only help you grow your career, but to grow your influence and become a part? Your your job is to integrate or align yourself with the organisational brand. Mm. And, you know, digital platforms are often a place to start too. Yeah, I love that. And I think it was you who said, or you shared it with me a while ago about, you know, when you look at people's LinkedIn profiles, as an example, um, you know, most of them look like an obituary as opposed to, as opposed to a, another piece of branding for, for the organization you work for. So I love that. And, and I think it's, it's a, you know, update your LinkedIn profile and use it as part of brand ambassadorship for, for who you work for. I love it. And of course that might mean people might approach you and say, geez, you look good. Would you like to work for us? But at the same time, you're also promoting your own brand of the organization. So, um, that's a really good flip or, or reframe around that. So, well, interestingly, what we found overwhelmingly, like we've I've written thousands of profiles. I've had writers who work with us, and we go in and then build LinkedIn strategy and branding strategy, um, particularly leveraging personal brands in in businesses. And overwhelmingly, every time we rewrite a profile from it looking like a job seeker to a brand ambassador profile, they actually have less people, less recruiters approaching them. So. It's um, so CEOs. It's often their biggest fear when we're working mm. with them of rewriting the profiles. But they actually get less approaches because what happens is it's very clear in the profile how committed they are to the organisation. Mm. There's a lot more emphasis on the organisation and the connection with the personal brand. So it actually repels um, a job a, a recruiter in some ways. And I think it ref- well, okay, for those who might be looking, it might refine it. Um, but I love that it actually it, it it'll sort out the tire kick, because that's for sure when it comes to recruiters looking for you. Yeah. It yeah. does, but equally, if you're a job seeker, if you're being p- more proactive, at least you've got a profile that's really professional, and yeah. it shows that you're you're committed to connecting with an organisation, and you're not just you know mm. there for yourself. But ninety seven percent of job seekers stalk their bo- potential boss on LinkedIn like <laughs> okay so, 97 percent 97 percent and 91 percent of 97 percent of um sorry 91 percent of job seekers and 97 percent of recruiters so we'll we'll use your profile as part of the recruitment process and you won't even know that they're on your radar so and then but 91 percent of um job seekers will go and look up the, like so if they're looking at a job on seek for example if they've got the person's name who the contact person is or even the recruiter um mm. or the if it's the head of recruitment that company but they'll go in and look at the person like so could i work with this person you know i'm going to mm. spend more time with this person than i do with my family like, like do i could i work with them they they're definitely looking at your profile um, and, you know, often the, one of the most valuable things is when you connect on or look at that person's profile is actually where it says you have these people in, in connect, like who in, as common connections. So, of course, you're going to look through there and go, oh, who can I ring? Do you know this person? What are they like? Mm. You know, there's so much going on that we sometimes don't even realise is happening just purely because of brand. Oh, yeah. And I think that just, that leads the, or opens the doorway for any manager or leader who who does get their LinkedIn profile up to date and looking like it's an ambassadorial piece. It's an attractor then also for when the time comes you need to recruit. So everyone wins in that particular scenario. And I, and I would say to anyone listening, look at Jane Anderson's LinkedIn profile. Check mine out because you can imagine I have actually taken a lesson from Jane um, as examples, you know. Um, and I think that uh, if you get the opportunity to attend any of Jane's social media programs, go for it. It's worth every single cent that you spend on those. Um, and I think the other thing that I, because you talked about the influencer indicator, and I just want to come back to that a little yeah. bit because yeah. you talked about um, findability and networks. And mm. to me, that's really clear as someone who runs their own practice or business. But if you're inside the organisation, I, I kind of, I'm trying to translate it and say, okay, so how does this translate for a leader or manager? So it's obviously industry events, but what else is there that gets yeah. networked? Yeah, so a few benefits are things like, like, let's say if part of your career progression has been about um, perhaps speaking at 
industry events and conferences. Like maybe you get to showcase some of the great work you've done. So maybe you're, you know, if you're in risk and compliance, it might be maybe you're presenting on a project at the Compliance Institute. And, but if you're going to be speaking at that, if there's like 50 people at that conference or 100 or 500, then of course people are going to be coming to your profile and going, oh, oh, what has this person done and who are they? And so, you know, um, so there's one of being how you're validated, but there's also um, industry events and things like that where they're trying to um, give organisations opportunities to showcase their work. Here's what world's best practice is. Here's what this looks like. So if you're trying to build your positioning and, and, and brand but be able to also be a brand ambassador, a big part of that is you being able to showcase work um, that you're doing at industry events. So that would be one is um, to be able to, and then you can also use your profile to reach out to create those opportunities. So if you're reaching out to those people and you're saying, hi, I don't know if you know me, but this is what we do and we've actually had this and I'd, I'd love to speak at this event. They're gonna look at your profile. They're gonna look at, well, who is this person? Do they have credibility? Why should we listen to them? Um, so it's not just about inbound opportunities but also a vehicle that you can reach out and then of course the next step is they're going to look at your profile so that you've got to validate really well mm -hmm. um the uh so um the other one is uh is like being findable most certainly so if i'm trying to find someone like you keywords are really valuable so uh for example i did um worked with uh, the team at, uh, at an organisation, so they were mining resources type company. And we identified that those, the leaders or the managers in that organisation, um, recruitment said, look, we've done as much as we possibly can. It's actually the leaders that have the networks for great mm -hmm. talent, not us. We can rely on ads in Seek and, you know, and, and LinkedIn and all those types of things. But how the people in the organisation, the leaders we've got, they have got the industry connections. What can we do to help them? Mm -hmm. So what we did was built the profiles of all the leaders so that they were really proud of their profiles. And actually, it actually really builds their confidence. Like you, they're kind of actually like, oh, yeah, I've had this professionally written. It looks much better. And oh, never. Wow, I, I am kind of good, right? Yeah. Um, so, is, that, <laughs> is that actually me? <laughs> And it's really nice to give them that experience because we have professional writers will come in and we see what we see and we've, we've done so many of them that they kind of, it gives them a newfound confidence to reach out and, and have a conversation or reach out. And um, so they then have the ability to go and start a conversation or to say, look, we're looking at finding talent like this. And so because say something like LinkedIn has, um, uh, people who turn up in search results are those people you're connected to. So one of the areas in the influencer indicator is we talk about um, building awareness. So, uh, and so there are a lot of passive candidates on say something like LinkedIn. So we have to enable people to, how do you leverage your brand so that, and give you some scripts. So often they're, they're not reaching out because they don't know what to say. Mm. So we'll often give them some scripts just to help them get started. And once they've seen that, they go, oh, I don't really say it like that. And go, well, how do you say it? And mm. they go, oh, I'd say this. Go, okay, so change that. Mm. Um, uh, the other thing that also can often work well is uh, we worked with a, uh, I worked with a financial services company. So it was when there was the change in legislation for superannuation in Australia, and it was in 2014. And there was about 70 financial planners that I had in this organisation. And uh, I noticed with the change in legislation, I was just sort of asking questions like, tell me a bit about how this legislation works and who are the people it affects. And, um, and I'd just written all the profiles for the planners. And I said, um, why don't I teach one of your planners how to run a webinar or a webcast? So because the average person on LinkedIn has 750 connections. So if you multiply 750 by 70, that's a lot of connections. Mm. So what I did was um, uh, taught them how to market a webcast and just around what the change was in legislation. I said, we're not looking at you to sell anything. It's purely around positioning you as the trusted brand and education is a really big part of, of, of being able to build a brand and be a trusted brand. And uh, they got 500 new leads out of that activity alone. 
So, you know, even if you're maybe not necessarily, and they weren't necessarily leading individual, leading teams, but they were, some were leaders, some were executives, but, but, but these were particularly, and then a couple of team leaders of the financial planners. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody can have an opportunity to contribute. Everybody can go, wow, I can actually get involved here and engage in the community and, and um, so, yeah, it was, uh, you know, so those types of things are, are really powerful. Yeah, you just struck a note with me around managers actually having a chat with their teams and saying, you know, what industry events do you know of? You know, what networking events do you know of? Uh, what LinkedIn groups are you a member of? And it's not to stalk you, but it's, you know, let us think broader and wider around how we can make an influence and how we can you know, build our brand, get more clients, get more connections. So I love that. And um, I've just done some work with a uh, solar company and they are one of Brisbane's um, oldest and longest serving solar companies, um, pre-solar actually. Uh, we're in batteries and, and all sorts of things. Um, I'm not technically minded down that way, so I don't really know. Mm -hmm. However, one of their values was educating, customer education. And that has been in place for more than 30 years. So it's interesting right. that um, that has held, had, has held fast as a value for them for so long. And the way in which they say it is, um, you know, the more we educate our customer, the more they, they, they trust us, which means, yes, we're expensive, but we're quality and we yeah. stand by what we do. So other, other values overlay with that with integrity, quality and, and quality service and leadership and things like that. But that education piece, I think yeah. if, we, if we step into our roles, uh, even as leaders and managers internally with that education and service mentality, um, you know, if I serve my team, I don't want to use the necessarily go down the servant leadership road, but if my, if my ability to influence is through educating and connecting, then how much richer are we going to be for it? That's right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you really be uh, ahead of your times. You know, if I look at, um, so last year KPMG did the global leaders, uh, global CEO survey. And... Uh, the concept of brand or the, you know, around the, the, the they had a list of the top 10. Um, so they do the survey every year and the top 10 uh, concerns for CEOs globally. So they survey all these CEOs. And brand had never even been in the top 16. Mm. And last year it was number three. Wow. So, and I think that's a real shift in our leaders are more transparent than they've ever been before. It's not that hard for me to Google you. Mm. And uh, like you look at the Harvey Weinsteins, the, you know, all that sort of stuff that happened last year. Mm. So, you know, and, you know, he founded the company and he ended up having to, to go facing legal proceedings. So the question is, is who are our leaders really? Mm. Like, are they actually of good character? Mm. Are they actually decent human beings? Because how is um, I, maybe I shouldn't say this on the on the um, <laughs> podcast. Oh, well, you have to say it now. <laughs> say it now. But it's like the CEO who was here in uh, Brisbane, who was the um the pooper. You know, like, did you hear about that? The CEO, he was like, he, he lives near me here, and like, I'm on the um southern side over Annerley but um it was the CEO of the aged care so we had a problem with somebody who was pooping in a um co a, a apartment complex and these neighbors were all out there trying to work out who's the person doing this pooping out in this and the, so it went on for months and months <laughs> uh, it's terrible it was the CEO of a major I won't say who the company was you can google it and you'll you'll find it but like really <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so here you go folks you've heard it here first it doesn't take much to be a decent leader don't poop <laughs> just in don't apartment poop. places i mean seriously don't poop in public places. Oh. seriously like yeah so you know so this person took this took the person's photo of them like they caught they caught them in the middle of the night this person pooping took their photo put their photo then on uh social media so does anyone know who this person is and of course, then they went, ah, oh, yeah, that's kind of the CEO oh. of our company. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's terrible. And it's gold. And it's terrible. And it's gold. <laughs> 
so wrong. Yeah, it is so wrong. It is so wrong. So good for a story to explain. Yeah. Why why this stuff's so powerful? You know, we're more transparent than ever. So the question is really around who who really you know if if I did go and Google your name, I found a you know as a client who I had who was having a lot of trouble being able to get work at one point. And uh, so I Googled his email address because I was Googling his name and I wasn't, you know, having any trouble with that. So I've got to think like a, a devious recruiter when I'm doing things, if, I'm, if people are having problems. And I Googled his email address and I found him on a site called lieschatesandbastards.com. <laughs> so that was a very uncomfortable conversation that I had to have a conversation with him about. Mm. But the thing is, right, that... Who's going to tell him that? Yeah. So, that, that's so true. So he's gone on trying to progress his career mm. and no one's going to say, oh, look, you actually didn't get the job because we found you on lieschatesandbastards.com. No one's going to tell you that. Um, so he didn't know. Mm. And he was absolutely mortified. Like I'm, I'm not here to judge. I have no yeah. idea what's going on. All I'm here is to just show you, make you aware, because he just mm. had no idea that that's mm. what was being said about him. Mm. Um, so you know, you, um, the thing is, is that you won't, you won't hear if something is wrong. Mm. People will just disappear, won't they? They'll take their business elsewhere. Yeah, well, they just don't ring you. Yeah, well, they just that, no, the opportunities. That's the other thing, don't you? You know, you get overseen in the organisation, and until you push, until you find someone who's brave enough to actually say, which I think is a sad thing. Again, it comes back to the anonymous three hundred and sixty piece about if we didn't do these anonymously, people might have the skills and ability to actually say, you know what? It's because you did this. Um, yeah. And I think we would all benefit. And the other piece is, as complex as this all sounds, there's a, there's a kind of, in my head, I always look, I always kind of try to go, where's the simple in this? Because we are yeah. very prone to finding things and making them more complex than they need to be. Yeah. And the simple in this is, you really just have to be the best version of yourself. Just be a decent That's human it. being. And you're allowed to make mistakes. Probably not open apartments, but you're allowed to make oh, mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all up from here. If you don't poop in apartments, I mean, you know, I'm stuck on that now. Um, <laughs> but, but do you know what I mean? Like, I think that, I think we've got a great opportunity to just take a breath jump in and do the influencer indicator and I'll absolutely have all the links on the show notes. I think that's a really great place to sort of go, all right, if I want to get get by in this job, and even if I just want to do better and stay in my role, I don't want to climb any ladder, uh, or if yeah. I do, um, then I need to have a, a snapshot. And that goes back to what you said in the beginning is around insight so, and the clarity. So, yeah. yeah. And the value of what you bring to the organisation. So, you know, maybe you don't necessarily... I, um, I worked in a... a I did a team building session of building um, a team brand. So I sometimes do some work around team branding. And this person was in the group. Now, uh, it was a group of 30 people and this, there was probably three people who had been there more than two years. Everybody else was almost brand new or had been there less than six months. It was a wholly new formed area. And this particular person, um, really lovely guy, he'd been there for like 15 years or something. And in his case, uh, he didn't want to be, he doesn't want to progress through to executive leadership and all that sort of stuff. But, man, what a major linchpin in that group. So, you know, really strong brand, brand presence, trusted, you know, being there so long. So, you know, for someone like him, you know, I always um, talk about Seth Godin's book, Linchpins. Like, that's a classic linchpin is a person, is their networks are, are strong in the organisation. He was also um, connects a lot with people outside the organisation. So someone like that is, re- you can be really influential without necessarily being in a senior leadership role if you mm. it's all about who you, if you if you connect at a human level with people you know people you're interested in people and uh and that is a big big part of your your brand mm. if your brand is and you want to build your brand um without and and to have influence to create the type of role you want mm. not necessarily about climbing the ladder 
Mm, yeah, and leadership's a behaviour, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it, it it can happen at any level, no matter what. So, uh, oh, right, it's not a title, that's for sure. Yeah, look, Jane, you and I could talk for about another seventeen thousand hours, um, <laughs> and I certainly want to hear more stories. Probably not poop ones, but oh, anyway. All right, I'll cut those. <laughs> Sorry. That is so funny. Um, so yeah. when I get the when I get when I get the transcript of this, I can't I wait to get some you back. <laughs> I'll always invite you back. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I will put all the the links in, uh, to finding the influencer indicator, like all your books. I love this book, this expert influencer book. The twelve skills in there. It is um, you know there are there are lines, people. There are things to do. There's activities yes. and exercises, and so right. um, I think this is probably hands down one of the best resources for you to understand who you are inside your organisation, inside your profession, your career, and even within your business as well if you're running a business. So thank you very much, Jane. Um, all the links will be there, and so if you want to just check out Jane, you go to all the W's, JaneAndersonSpeaks.com. And she's got programs, she's got events, she's got resources, she's got everything. Um, and she is my mentor and my great friend and I am so grateful to, for you to spend time on people and management. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Sally. Um, thanks again, Jane. Right, really thank appreciate you again it. for having me. Thank my you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank yes. you. And if you want more people and management, just jump, jump on to all the W's, sallyfoleylewis.com. Subscribe to the flow notes that come out every week. And in there, you'll be the first to hear my latest analogy, my, see my latest video and all the programs that I offer. And I look forward to connecting with you again on another episode of People and Management. Bye for now.